always talk about the wonders of modern science as preparing us for the future. But one aspect of science we often forget about is the knowledge of the past, archaeology. Just think of some of the fascinating discoveries that have recently been made about ancient Greece. Dr. John Papadimitou was digging near a village in Greece and uncovered 15 wooden vases carved in geometrical designs. It was the first such find in history. The vases had been preserved in mud since the 5th and 6th centuries B.C. Or take the example of Professor John L. Kasky from the University of Cincinnati. He found a Mycenaean settlement that dates back some 3,500 years. He found a temple, palace, private homes with inside plumbing, and a municipal sewer system 3,500 years ago. From time to time, we learn of new excavations that bring old civilizations to light. Archaeology helps us understand our origins. It gives us an appreciation of other societies and more insight into our own. But you should be an archaeologist too. And you don't need an axe or a shovel or any instrument for that matter. All you need is five minutes when you can rest after your day's work. Use these five minutes to concentrate on yourself to try to find those hidden treasures that you've forgotten about for ages. Dig down through the debris of failure, and you will find hidden treasures that are more important to you than those found in some bygone civilization. These treasures are your self-respect, sincerity, understanding, your self-confidence, and your courage. They will help you reach your daily goal. They will give you the proper self-image and bring success to your undertakings. How do you appraise yourself? It's remarkable that we're at least objective in appraising ourselves. Masterly in our understanding of others, we may still be irrational in understanding ourselves. From what I've read, even the great Sigmund Freud, whose creative and courageous work has had such impact on our thinking, could not completely fathom the mysteries of his own mind. And so it goes with others. The physicist, master of technical concepts, may have a distorted, untruthful view of himself. The judge, who dedicates his life to justice and truth, may know little truth about himself. Now, what is your truth about yourself? Do you feel inferior because you never made as much money as someone else? Is your truth that as a single woman you're a total failure because you didn't marry? Or do you believe a physical feature shows your inferiority? A long nose, a weak chin? Or do you destroy yourself with other so-called truths? Too many people see only negation when they think they see truths about themselves. They block off joy because they're so critical of themselves that truths are distortions. Stop shortchanging yourself and dehypnotize yourself from your ridiculous attacks on yourself. Try to be objective. Give yourself some justice for a change. Then you may be able to move forward into a more creative life. The more you dehypnotize yourself with psychocybernetics, the more opportunities you'll find to succeed. How do you know you are yourself with all the pressures and tensions facing you? The business of being your true self consists in standing up to pressures, the tensions and problems of the day. Problems will always confront us. They are there to surmount. That is what enhances our integrity as human beings, giving muscle to our spiritual and intellectual fibers. Success doesn't mean being successful. Success means the capacity to rise above a problem, a failure, a tension, a corrosion, a conflict. How do you know yourself? You begin to know yourself when you give yourself the chance to develop and make your image grow when you tackle problems. If you let negative feelings overcome you and complain that life was unkind, that you were born unlucky, then you are not yourself. Then you become less than what you really are and you make your image shrink in size. How do you know yourself? You look in the mirror and ask yourself this question. And you, not someone else, must answer it. You answer it by knowing you are a combination of frustration and confidence, happiness and despair, and you resolve to mean something to no one but to yourself. And through this resolve, you have the desire to amount to your true self. This desire gives you the direction to reach your goal of finding the better part of you, the true you, refusing to be less than what you think you are through some error of the past. You are yourself when you are true to yourself. Then life has meaning.
Psycho-Cybernetics allows you to surgically remove the inside-the-mind scar tissue that is concealing the real you. We are all born with a real self. It is ours since birth. As we grow up, our self becomes more developed through experience. But we do not start out with everything. One of the things that we have to acquire is personality. Even babies take on personality in very short order. In fact, many of us think of babies as all personality. Just about everyone loves little babies. Why? They're cute, of course, but it's their open personality that we like best. When a baby is unhappy, he cries, and we know that he cries freely. And when the baby is happy, he also expresses himself freely. The expression may be totally spontaneous, a grin erupting into a gurgle, but it gives us great pleasure. The baby communicates his personality. He's spontaneous. He has not yet learned our refinements, our ways of hiding and holding back our emotions. Which emotion hurts a person the most? All negative feelings hurt in various degrees, depending upon the individual. The fear of making a mistake which prevents you from taking chances in life, hurts you. The feeling of insecurity that you're nobody because you failed in some undertaking hurts. Aggressiveness of the wrong kind when you hurt others hurts you a great deal. Loneliness, that terrifying feeling of being separate from others, even though you may be in a room with a thousand people, hurts because you have denied yourself the right to communicate with yourself and with others. Uncertainty the feeling that life is too frenetic hurts you because you cannot relax and cannot respond to the times of stress. Hatred is even worse. Hatred means that you hate yourself first and then you hate other people. It means that you have become a traitor to yourself, letting the termites of nothingness bore holes within your mind and spirit, leaving you empty as a human being. With hatred go envy, jealousy, and all the cancerous moods that deprive you of your self-respect as a human being. However, I believe that indifference is the one emotion that hurts a person most because it means emptiness. It means that you're hibernating from reality, living in a make-believe world, a dark dungeon, a concentration camp you have built for yourself, and you negate your life force. Life changes every day, and not reacting to it in a creative way means that every day you're dying, not living. Creative living stems from a constructive point of view. Not responding to life makes one a vegetable. It is far better to try and fail than leave things as they are and not bother trying. Up and down. We all have these ups and downs, which we call moods, which depend on the image we have of ourselves as we meet the pressures and challenges of living. At low periods, we become more critical at times, critical of others and of ourselves. We are more irritable and care little about other people. We are depressed, unhappy, ashamed of our self-image. The high periods are periods of hope and excitement, periods of belief and self-confidence. We exultantly tackle the day's problems to reach our daily goal with assurance. Here we have a self-image we're proud of, one we can live with. We feel on top of the world until we dispose of the surplus energy we have stored. Then subsequently, we may fall into another slump of depression and discouragement. Man has his ups and downs at various times. He is filled with belief and hope on one occasion, and then filled with frustration and despair on another occasion. He's filled with compassion today, and with resentment tomorrow. There is an eternal struggle within him between the will to find his self-respect and the will to renounce his identity. The eternal battle between his big self and his little self. This is man. Yet, with his desire for self-fulfillment, he can rise above failure, mistake, a blunder, or a heartache, and become the successful human being he really likes. And he can also use the confidence of his past successes in his present undertaking to make himself a happier person most of the time. A man may be down, overwhelmed with a deep depression as a result of failure, but because of his fortitude, he can rise above it to amount to his big self. And it's just as true that a moment of success Achieving a goal, at that moment, he may be overcome with a deep feeling of depression. I have found this in myself and in many successful people in all walks of life. 
artists, actors, musicians, physicians, lawyers, teachers, and successful students. When depression suddenly appears, remember to adjust to it, that tomorrow is another day to reach fulfillment, that depression is one of the traits of humanity, and it should be a stimulus for you to rise above it and reach for your better self. You should understand that your behavior depends on your self-image and that this self-image can change back and forth like your face, depending on whether it is tense or relaxed. Since your moods are part of the natural business of living, no matter how dismal the outlook may seem to you when you are low, remember this. You will feel better presently if you can reactivate the success mechanism within you. Use your imagination. Sit down in a chair and relax. Go into a room of your mind. See in your mind your past successes. Picture them and feel them. This will help you improve your self-image, returning to you confidence and happiness. Have you ever noticed that when you're in a good mood, things seem to go better? When you're in a bad mood, things seem to go badly? In both cases, the things we experience seem to confirm and validate the mood we're in. Real or imagined injury, hurt feelings, remorse, guilt, heartache, or resentment. They block self-fulfillment. They steer you away from your goals. You must realize that it is you and you alone who are in a position to remove your emotional scars. You must nourish your self-respect and develop confidence in your own sense of direction. Self-fulfillment has to be achieved. A person who sees himself as liked, wanted, acceptable, and able. A person who feels oneness with others. He possesses a rich store of information and knowledge. Be too big to feel threatened. Have a self-reliant, responsible attitude. Relax away emotional hurts. Develop self-esteem. You must retain respect for yourself, even though you fail in an undertaking. You must always rise above a failure and try to reach your full stature of dignity as a real, fulfilled person. Program yourself for pleasant thinking. Concentrate on building self-confidence, esteem, self-expansion. Re-evaluate your beliefs. Live creatively. Your negative feelings are there for you to rise above. You do not have to respond at all times with negative feelings. You must learn to stand up under stress by remaining relaxed and free. You must see that you should not make mountains out of molehills. Be too big to be threatened by one error. Most writers will tell you that what they do is quite difficult. One famous writer said that creative writing is easy. You just sit down at the typewriter and give blood. Writers often talk about writer's block, which is really a mood or a state of mind that cuts off the flow of creative ideas. Dr. Maltz recalls this story about a friend with writer's block. A friend of mine, a famous author... A man who has written many fascinating novels told me a story about himself. One morning, he found himself in the grip of a strangely depressed mood. He felt scooped out, hollow, depleted. He felt like two bookends with no books between them. He was worried. He felt that there was nothing inside him anymore. He could not write. He called within himself and nothing happened. There was no response. He decided to go for a walk about the grounds of his farm. He filled his lungs with pure air. As he was walking, he paused before a grape arbor. He looked at the heavy clusters of purple concord hanging from the vines. He looked around him and saw other signs of the fantastic bounty of nature. In the orchard, he stopped before an apple tree. He had neglected this tree, had never pruned it, but nonetheless, it was heavy with fruit. All around him he saw the abundance of nature. Other greens, other views, other signs of the generous yield of nature. Who could tally this crop that surrounded him? In this great world of abundance, how can any one man be hollow? He was part of nature, part of its abundance. He walked back to his desk at peace with himself. He no longer felt depleted. Was it the actual abundance of nature, the real grapes, the real apples that caused the author's mood to change? No. Remember, as Dr. Maltz says, we do not respond to the world as it is. 
we respond to the world the way we imagine it to be. The abundance of nature caused a change in the images the author was entertaining, and these new, abundant, vital images are what changed his mood. We can literally create our own reality, a successful, prosperous, confident reality, or an incomplete, unfulfilling reality, purely by the power of our thinking. There is an abundance within yourself to make you happy. You are part of this world. You share its abundance. It exists within you. Confidence. Instant confidence can grow within you, ready to be harvested at any season, at any time. You just have to reach within yourself. You will find it in abundance. Now, I'm sure that God did not mean for us to spend so much of our time being miserable. For as human beings, you and I are among the most amazing and remarkable creatures on earth. We should devote more of our days to being glad about this and putting the wonder of ourselves to better use. We're all familiar with the physical symptoms of tension, the tight feeling in the stomach and throat, the restlessness, quick and heartbeats. We become jumpy, and we're really ready to jump, to jump away from danger, run from an enemy, or into a fight. Just as these symptoms are useful to an animal, they're helpful to us, too, when we encounter sudden danger. Take the simple act of driving on the highway. When the roads are relatively free from traffic, it's a pleasure to drive. Given room to maneuver a comfortable car and a well-designed road, the competent driver can find commuting a pleasure, often the refreshing period before and after a day's work. But when there is danger, either from another driver's recklessness bad weather conditions or too much traffic, we suddenly find ourselves under stress. Our tension reaction develops, and we should be thankful. It's something in our bodies which allows us to respond to situations more easily, more rapidly. It gives us that extra energy to be alert to the other car, the ice slick, or an instant stop. And in our modern age, there are lots of stress situations. In our work, we're sometimes in potentially dangerous situations in which our tension reactions helps us. Construction workers, electricians, factory workers, and many others are often faced with sudden physical danger. Their tension reactions protect them the minute they perceive any kind of physical threat. Another one of the most common sources of tension comes not from physical danger, but from interpersonal relations. In fact, the people who are closest to us, our parents, our children, our partners in both business and marriage, often give us the most cause for tension. A husband and wife in a simple argument, often provoke in each other the most primitive animal reactions of fighting and fear. Usually, when an argument is over, the tension leaves. But when situations are not resolved, people retain their fear and anger reactions, even when they're no longer needed. At this point, they hamper their lives. The tension no longer helps them, it hinders them. They're carrying the extra weight of the past on their backs. Worry is the least effective form of thinking. It causes anxiety and frustration. It shuts down creative thinking and robs us of energy that could be used to solve problems. Worry is destructive, and it produces no solutions, only more worry. Yet, we all worry, and we all seem to have many things to worry about. It's built into our culture. It's built into our style of thinking. We worry about our families, our futures, our health, our finances, our friends. Dr. Maltz has a powerful recipe to end worry, and that is to worry constructively. By doing so, you can actually build a new habit of thinking about problems that will lead you to solutions and achievement rather than frustration. Here are five simple techniques that Dr. Maltz suggests you use to stand up to worry. One. Don't ponder over how you're going to say something when you have a firm goal in your mind. Just open your mouth and say it. Improvise as you need to. Two, don't think too much before you act. Put your goal foremost in your mind and then act. Correct your actions as you go along, not before you start. Three, stop criticizing yourself after each action, no matter how simple. Use criticism sparingly, not continuously. Four, Make a habit of speaking louder than usual. Inhibited people are notoriously wispy voice. 
You don't have to shout at people, but just try to raise the volume of your voice. Five. Let people know you like them. Compliment at least three people a day. If you like what someone is wearing or doing, say so. Be direct. Here is another practical symbol of what you are learning in psychocybernetics. Go to the kitchen and get a small potato. Keep it someplace where you will see it every day this week while you are studying the lesson on self-confidence. Each time you see it, remind yourself not to let your self-image shrink to the size of this small potato. Say to yourself, I will not cuddle my regrets. I will not carry grudges. I shall forgive and forget. I will not waste precious time brooding on small matters. I shall make my image grow with the confidence I had in the past and the self-confidence I have now. Small potato, big potato. You can be as big as you want to be, as capable as you want to be, and as confident as you want to be in the ways that you want to be and as confident as you want to be through the bigness of your thinking. Psycho-cybernetics is about power. Far too many people needlessly give away their power over the present and the future to negative feelings rooted in their past. Today, far too many people give power over their lives to mind and mood-altering drugs, both legal and illegal. Now, with your growing understanding of psycho-cybernetics, you can firmly take the reins of power in your own life and be the very best you that you can be. Now, here's Dr. Maltz with his 10 Principles of Personal Power. One, realize that your principal goal in life is to live and be happy, and that confidence is a state of happiness that is a goal in itself. Two, confidence means positive thinking plus positive doing and trying. You must have a goal. You must have great desire, a feeling of enthusiasm that you can reach your goal. Imagine that you are already there. Three, you must think in terms of success, not failures. Evoke the feelings of past successes. If you feel successful, you will act with confidence. Four, acquire the habit of confidence. Confidence is built on confidence. Remember the saying, nothing succeeds like success. Five. Reactivate your cerebral mechanism to relive the confidence of the past. Six, go back in your memory and relive a successful experience. If you insist you've never had a successful experience, imagine in your mind how you would look and act if you were successful in some undertaking. The mind cannot tell the difference between a true experience and one vividly imagined in detail. Seven, if you insist on worrying... Then worry constructively about a positive goal, slowly and surely achieving your goal, saying to yourself that it is possible, not impossible, and that with a little courage and faith, you will reach it. Eight, accept negative feelings as a challenge. Remember, confidence is the capacity to rise above negative feelings, even failures. Nine, substitute a good feeling of confidence for a bad feeling of frustration. Make a habit of it. You can do it now. Ten. Don't replay an old record of frustration and unhappiness in your mind. Substitute a new record of confidence and happiness. You've almost reached the end of this second session of your psychocybernetics course. This system has been designed with many exercises you can do to learn and apply the ideas you're discovering. If you're not able to perform the following exercises right now, you may want to stop this tape in position to return to these exercises and go on to cassette three. Let's look now at the exercises in your guidebook for building self-confidence. In these exercises, you'll learn to vividly recall past successes and re-experience confident feelings. You will learn to create synthetic experience, that is, images of imagined successes that can't tell the difference between real and synthetic experience. You can program your servo mechanism for success with either or both types of experience. 
You'll also learn how to eliminate the negative feelings of past negative experiences. And you'll set clearer daily and weekly goals to stimulate the right kind of creative thinking. In your guidebook, turn to the page titled Effective Exercises for Creating Confident, Successful Feelings. Use these instructions to put the power-producing affirmation, I am confident, to work for you every day. Now here's Dr. Maltz with another mirror exercise. Write the words, self-confidence, on the mirror. Now look into it and say to yourself, I must use the principle of athletes to forget the failures of yesterday and concentrate on the successes of today. I must also concentrate on my past successes. After all, I have succeeded sometime in something. I must recall the confidence of past successes for my present undertaking and make it a habit like brushing my teeth. If I do this, I will achieve instant confidence. Next, you'll find the Constructive Worry Worksheet. This is a wonderful tool for replacing destructive worrying with the constructive, productive worrying that frees you, not freezes you, that achieves goals and leads to success. You'll notice that you're invited to photocopy this worksheet. Many people continue to use it frequently, literally for life, and you may want to do the same. Next, you have more goals exercises. Remember that the very basis of psychocybernetics is your natural goal-seeking behavior. You're certain to be at your best automatically when you have positive goals clearly in mind. Remember to take a little time to relax, mentally and physically, before involving yourself in these exercises. Then you'll not only be learning more about psychocybernetics with each exercise, each day, you'll also be programming your powerful servo mechanism for greater success. In the next session, we'll join Dr. Maltz as he discussed the quest for happiness. This concludes Side B. Our program is continued on the next cassette.